What is up, you guys? Welcome back to Title Gardens. We are now just getting into 2021, and this building has been a work in progress for pretty much a few years at this point. And over the years, I've got a lot of questions as to whether there's anything that we would have changed knowing then what we know now. And there's always going to be a little bit of that. Even though we had a greenhouse system for over 10 years, learned a lot of lessons from that greenhouse aquaculture setup in designing and building this building. But even in this building, there's more lessons to learn in the development and building process. So I wanted to go over a little list of things that could use a bit of improvement. Now, some of these things are super minor. Some of the things on this list are wishful thinking sort of things also. There's not a lot of like egregious mistakes, I don't think, but we, I guess we'll see, right? So the very first thing that I would like to have changed is our grow out tanks. They are 15 inches tall. And I think that if I had to redesign it, I would have gone a little bit deeper. Now, when I originally planned those systems, I planned for them to be uh, slightly lower so you can get into the tanks easier, but not too low that you'd have to like bend down and sideways in order to see in through the side. Now, in the whole process of getting those aquariums, the plans change because originally, originally, the aluminum stands were designed to sit directly on the floor. And there's all kinds of issues with that. And I was thinking about it more and more and more because how are we going to get the aquariums onto these stands? I mean, these aquariums are like hundreds and hundreds of pounds. We're really not able to get a forklift, drive it 100 feet through the building and set these tanks down on these stands surgically. I mean, it gets tighter and tighter to work around those tanks. Certainly a forklift type, type thing's not going to happen. I was then thinking, okay, I need to bite the bullet and just pay for these like amazing leveling casters. They're like solid blocks of aluminum. Each one can hold like 2,200 pounds. This is what I need. It's gonna cost a small fortune, especially when you need to do it for the initial 10 aquarium stands, right? But those things have been incredible. Now going back to the height of the aquariums, by adding those leveling casters, that adds six inches. What went from something that's very easy for everybody to get into is probably like three quarters of an inch too tall for me. And I'm the tallest person here. So everybody else is a little bit more inconvenienced by the overall height. Having said that, having the, the, the tanks higher up does look nicer. The depth of the tank, I would have liked to have been deeper. So long story short there, I would have wanted a shorter stand to compensate for the casters and also a shorter stand to compensate for a deeper aquarium because the thickness of the glass of these frag tanks is pretty thick. It's three quarter inch. When I initially spec'd out a 15 inch deep tank, that is taking into consideration now the bottom of the tank and the top of the air brace. That's an inch and a half. So my 15 inch tank is now really a 13 and a half inch tank. And also just by the depth of the, um, of the overflow box, that also adds maybe like another inch and change of airspace now in the tank. So it's not even that, that I get the entire 13 and a half inches of water volume. I'm really looking at about 12 inches now. I wanted something a lot, I wanted 15, right? And, and I ended up with 12. In the future, I would probably spec out an 18 inch deep tank, knowing full well that a good three inches of that might get eaten up by glass and airspace. But as far as those leveling casters go, I have zero regrets. There's, besides the fact that we were able to load up the tanks onto those stands at the door and roll everything back, that's been great. The fact that you can level each one has been great. And also, the way that we plumbed the aquariums, we were able to fit the three inch drains plus unistrut underneath the aluminum part of the stand and it fit like a glove. As far as my decision to, um, to get those guys on casters, no regrets. Also, 
just being able to do like micro adjustments to micro adjust like 10 and a half foot long tanks that weigh a ton. It's, it's super challenging, except if they're on wheels, right? All right, the next thing I would like to change is plumbing related. There are a lot of threaded connections throughout this whole building. And given the, the number of threaded connections, it's probably not a bad issue. Problem is, in the one or two times that it is an issue, there's a leak. Very annoying. There's probably no joke, 500 to 1,000 of these connections, and maybe one or two are leaking. Extent of the leak is probably on the order of one drop per day. Again, not the end of the world. And over time, some of these things just kind of get calcified and seal themselves up. But if I could go back, I would probably go with a lot more slip fittings and have everything like well glued. The reason why there are so many of these threaded guys, a lot of times it's around bulkheads. The bulkhead manufacturers that we went with did not give us the option of a mismatched thread to slip. On the inside of a lot of these tanks, we want threaded because we want to thread in uh, like a standpipe or thread in like a lock line adapter. And on the other side, I would like to have that be slip so we can glue that but a lot of bulkheads don't have the, the thread to slip. It's either thread thread or slip slip. We decided to go with the thread for, for both sides. Hindsight 2020, it would have been nice to go with more slip, but at the same time, it's like, it's not a huge issue. The other nice thing about slip is that you can, I think you can get a slightly lower profile and it would just look cleaner. There's less parts, so yeah. Minor. You might think, well, why don't I just change brands? Because certain brands do have the ability to have like different, uh, different types of connections. The problem there is that these glass tanks are already drilled. And you would think, oh, but that's okay. You can just take somebody's uh, inch and a half, let's say a Hayward, and a Spears inch and a half, and they're interchangeable. No. When it comes to Schedule 80 plumbing, and especially bulkheads, there is no standard size to those. So a Hayward inch and a half is substantially larger than a Spears inch and a half. Going cross brand is not really a thing unless your initial hole for that bulkhead is pretty gigantic and has a lot of like a lot of play in there. Ours just don't. They can fit Spears and they can fit the stuff that comes from BRS. So unfortunately, like going to a lot of like the higher, higher end brands, like, like the Haywards, the Asahis and stuff like that, it's not really a, a choice that was available to us. Ah, <sighs> uh, yes. Okay. Next item on the list is our electrical capacity at this building. I know very little when it comes to electrical. I know a lot more about plumbing, but when it comes to electrical, I am like the blankest slate. I'll believe anything, okay? And I think I didn't get the best guidance in the world initially when it came to setting up the electrical for this building. All I knew is I wanted 400 amp three phase, and I'll go from there. Now, already I think most electricians would say, you don't need 400 amp three phase. And in a normal building, they might be right. In this type of building though, where at a moment's notice, I might want to add a 20 ton dehumidifier. I, just just on a whim, I might want to do something like that. Like the electrical capacity of any building, I'm pretty sure that I could maximize. Maybe one day I might want to have like a bank of like CNC machines or so, just something hugely energy drawing, right? It's not in the initial plan a year one or year two or year three, down the road, something crazy might show up on a crane truck. It just slammed into place let's plug this thing in right this place the transformer is set up for let me check my notes it's like the 110 240 volt i guess there is a another option which would have been a 200 400 ish 440 460 volt and then you step it down to your your residential ish 110 240. now why does this matter? From what I heard, again, uh, me knowing nothing about electrical, is that if you start with that 200-400 volt uh, transformer, 
you get like triple the power or something like that. And that would have been nice to, just to know that I have like that, that upper capacity. And the reason why I really can't get that now, I can't just swap out the uh, existing transformer because I would also have to swap out all the wiring from here to the street, which is probably 400 feet away. And, and to redo that might not be possible. I'm kind of stuck with uh, the power that I have, which is a lot of power, but it's not as much as I could have had. This also came to bite me in the butt when it came time for me to spec out battery and solar options. I wanted to get Tesla batteries, and it just so happens that I am in like this perfect gray area of stuff that doesn't work. Tesla makes two battery products. They make a residential power wall, which is basically like 110, uh, like it's single phase 110, 240, 220, whatever. And then there is the commercial uh, mega pack, which is that 200, 400 volt stuff, three phase. They don't have a 110, 220 volt three phase. Like I'm just in this perfect little band of there's nothing. So I can't get power walls. I can't get mega packs. I have to like come up with other solutions entirely. Anyway, long story short, I would have done the electrical capacity of all the stuff back here differently had I known anything about electrical. Dog piling on electrical a little bit more. We have uh, two breaker boxes in this building. And I think, shoot, each one must have like 50 breakers. Hindsight being 2020, that's not enough. I wanted to have pretty much every outlet in this entire building on its own breaker. And eventually we had to like double up on breakers and stuff like that. I think if I had a little bit of foresight, this building should have at least four breaker boxes, each one with at least 50 to 60 breakers, because the, the, the number of, of individual outlets, the number of like mega devices that we ended up plugging into this place, it could have used all of them. No question. And, and what happened is we had to eventually use like these like double breakers, like these double 20 amp guys, and it's, it, it got messy in a hurry. And I'm like... It should not have been this messy on a brand new build. Okay, strike three on electrical. <laughs> so the initial, okay, so I've now worked with two electricians. First one, not my favorite. Second one, much, much better. But going back to the first one still, there was a time when my plumber was asking me, hey, these two electrical boxes, do you want me to put a conduit in the ground between these two right now for you. So it'll be inside the building and everything like that. And I'm like, that sounds like a good idea. Let me check with the electrician. So I asked the electrician, hey, should I have my plumber put this conduit down into the ground for you right now before they pour concrete? And he said, no, 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 it's okay. We'll just go from the outside. And I'm like, okay, if that's how you prefer it, does, uh, whatever. Okay, you're the electrician. I'm not gonna like tell you how to do your job or anything like that. That sounds like kind of kind of really dumb. Okay, it sounds really, 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 really dumb. But if this is how electricians like to do it, they approach it from the outside of the building. We'll do it that way. Stupid. No, it should have been done by the plumber inside the building. Of course, right? So that was kind of uh, again hindsight 2020. I would have liked to have all that in, inside the building. Also, when they finally did it on the outside of the building, it was kind of like a janky job too. On top of all of that, it was like stupid. So dumb, so dumb. All right. The other thing, I guess, going back to those conduit sleeves like inside the building, it's it would actually have been a good idea just to put in a couple of those for random unexpected things to like to shove down in there. There's been already been a lot of instances where just being able to throw a lot of a like cabling and stuff like that for wire management going from like point A to point B in the building has been like super helpful. Had we had any idea 
of like the connectivity of this building and what we would need. These sorts of like little tunnels and stuff like that are crazy helpful. So I think in the future, I would kind of want these like little connecting things just almost randomly throughout the building because they're, they're, they're pretty nice. Okay, next item. We have these conduit sleeves that go outside of the building. So it's kind of like a, well, I think they're literally called sleeves. So we have like four and six inch sleeves going out. And we were doing that to like bring in like water lines, to bring in uh, like all kinds of different things. We have a like a 10 GBE fiber optic line that comes from the house, stuff like that. So anyway, like it's it's to get outside lines into the building. Now, every single time that I talk to the plumber and he's like saying, okay, so we have these three, you know, they're going to be used for these purposes. And I was always like, why don't you toss in an extra one just in case? And the, the, these are big, so they can fit a ton of stuff through them, right? And he's like saying, he's in, you know, plumber early days was just thinking we would never need this many connections. And fast forward about two years and the plumber's like, had I known that this project was going to be like this and that the amount of project creep that happens in a building like this, I would have put in a dozen more, like a dozen easily because every single one of those, let's just put one in extra. Every single one of those is used up and they were used up within like three months. It was like, it was, they filled up fast going back. Yeah. We probably would have put in a lot more access sleeves that way. The cool thing, I guess, about my plumber, is that he is so game to try new and interesting projects, like really ambitious stuff. It was so good that he entertained all of my eccentricities right in the very beginning. And now that we're doing like the really crazy stuff, there is some infrastructure in place from day one to accomplish this. So love him for that. Next thing is not so much a mistake or anything like that. It's more pie in the sky sort of things. This building is insulated with like R19 fiberglass bat in the walls and they, they blew in insulation in the attic space. If I had infinite money, let's say, there is a better insulation for this type of building. It is closed cell spray foam. Closed cell as opposed to open cell means that like every single, I guess like poor, for lack of a better, I, I don't know what the, the exact phrase for this is, but every little bit of it is a self-sealing bubble. When you have that kind of structure, it is super insulating for the, the thickness. It's also sound dampening. So like the noises from, from the outside of the building coming in, it gets like extra dampened by that. Also, it is completely waterproof. Think where that might come in handy, you know, with like the humidity of this place and also like possible spills and everything like that. And any kind of like water penetration from the outside, this type of insulation ignores all water-based issues. You'll never have to deal with mold or anything like that. So ideally, that is the material that we would have gone with. The problem with that material is that when we got a quote for it, it was $70,000 more than the fiberglass bat that we ended up putting in. So at the time, it wasn't something that we could, we could just plow that kind of money into, unfortunately. If I was to ever do anything again with an insane budget, that's the material I would have gone with. We kind of did a halfway measure. We put like a, I think a three or a six mil plastic layer uh, underneath our um, our interior paneling, so we do have some um, some vapor protection of the fiberglass from inside the building out. So we talked about the insulation and the weather sealing from the inside of the building humidity into the wall. Right now, let's talk about the outside of the building a little bit. When we initially got the quote from the builder to do this building, it was easily hundreds of thousands of dollars less than the competitors. In many cases, it was like a half or a third of the price. And normally that should set off red flags. However, this particular builder, I had already seen his work. 
not only had I, had I seen his work, I seen his work building another coral farm specifically. I wasn't going into this blind. I could directly see the work product, okay? And I thought, it's pretty good. Now, the one thing that I didn't realize until like literally after the entire building was done was that these guys aren't exactly known for building commercial warehouses or anything like that or building coral farms or anything like that. Their sweet spot is building horse barns. That kind of explains the price point because what is good enough for horse barns is significantly less than what is good enough for, say, a research facility, right? Or a hospital. Kind of different stuff. So one thing that I could absolutely point to, well, besides overall fit and finish, like certain things, not, not, the, not the most square thing in the world, whatever happens, right? Builders. But one thing that I absolutely noticed was they didn't put Tyvek building wrap on this thing. And it, I guess it's like not a, not a big deal because like this, this building really is fine. It's fine. But it was kind of a, a head scratch. It's like I was kind of expecting that there would be Tyvek. Kind of strange. But I guess if you come from horse barn world, who cares, right? It's a horse barn. But so, yeah, that was just kind of like a, a little bit of a head scratcher. And looking back at it also, I don't think Tyvek is even expensive. Like, I just don't know why that wasn't just part of the building. Anyway, <laughs> c'est la vie. Builders get a little bit more grief about something else. <laughs> it's the, uh, the glass double doors uh, coming into this building. So we have two sets of uh, double doors. So like they're, they're, eight, they're eight foot doors, four feet on each side. <sighs> we specifically asked for double pane windows. Okay. Specifically asked for double pane because I know what kind of humidity is going to be in this building. If it's not double pane, it is going to have some serious condensation issues. All right. The doors show up. They don't look double pane. And we received assurances that they were double pane. And we also received assurances that, no, this is what these doors are. They're, they're, they just are just like this. And I'm like, these really look like single pane. We're in winter now. They are single pane. They have a waterfall of condensation coming down in front of them every, every single day. And they're metal. So there's like rust spots already forming. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, that sucks. That sucks. Actually, this is a question for you guys, especially you guys that know how to like hang doors and are into carpentry, okay? Is it possible to rip these doors off and put another set of doors in? Reason why I ask is, obviously, I want double pane. But if I could take these doors off and repurpose them into another building that is not temperature controlled, because we've got like other barns and stuff like that. These uh, commercial doors would be fine in a building like that. Just out of curiosity, how feasible is it to rip these guys out and reinstall them somewhere else and then have another set of double doors with double pane glass inserts? How possible is that, guys? Let me know in the comments below. I'm curious. Also, if we were super jank about it, how feasible is it for me to add an additional pane of glass to these existing doors if we were getting into some kind of DIY project? Let me know about that. Not a carpenter. Maybe I'm just wishful thinking over here. Last item on this list. Again, pie in the sky sort of thing. I would have gone bigger with this building. We aren't even halfway full of this existing building. And I can already see a future where we are going to be crammed for space and I wish we had more square footage to do other things and not necessarily even to have more tanks. I think as far as like our tank capacity and everything between the greenhouse and here, we're good actually. We're good for like a really long time. In fact, it's going to be hard to fully keep up on just the tank portion of this. But there's so many like little side projects and little side activities that complement what goes on here that I could totally see a situation where that additional square footage would help. Storage is a big deal. For example, the amount that we purchase in shipping boxes and shipping materials is extreme. We have this other barn, let's say, I don't know, it's like maybe 1400 square feet. And 
we've like from floor to ceiling it's filled with boxes we would actually buy more boxes because of how quickly we ship stuff out of here that at any given time there could be like a plus or minus like three pallets of boxes in the mix. We have to be careful of how many boxes we order to make sure that we have enough boxes, but also have enough storage space to put those boxes. Like we're, that, that's that's how uh, how thin that little uh, comfort zone is. I would never have thought that I would need a warehouse just for our packing materials, but here we are. Same thing goes with salt. We go through a lot of salt, a lot more salt than I ever thought that we would. And again, that goes back to the whole shipping stuff out. Like when you're shipping out, like literal pallets of boxes, sometimes like daily, that's taking out a lot of salt water and just sending it on a UPS truck. And so, yeah, it's like you go through a lot more salt, just topping off with like straight salt water. More square footage for that. That's kind of expensive square footage though. The other thing that I would like to use square footage for other than like more aquariums and stuff like that would be like fabrications type stuff. Like the amount of stuff that we actually fabricate on site here is pretty extreme. Like we could absolutely use 2000 some odd square feet just for fabrication projects. And I would love to have like 3D printers and like a CNC, like a real CNC, like a, that can do like a four by eight sheet because we use so much stuff here. And so much stuff is like kind of custom. Now we're working with some custom manufacturers and stuff like that, but sometimes it's just like the lead times are, um, they're, they're extreme sometimes. You know, there's, there's a lot of activity going on. It would be nice just to be able to, just to, to do some of these projects just on site. It's like, you know, run the machine. Let's get this going. Yeah, we would have gone bigger. Now, I say pie in the sky because there's no way that we could have afforded anything bigger than this place. When you start to scale up square footage on a place like this, it is nuts. Just the upstairs floor here, we have uh, some luxury vinyl tiles that that's what it's called. It's LVT, right? Luxury vinyl tile. And it's one, it's a 100% vinyl product. It's really nice, completely waterproof, everything. This variety is not the click into place kind. It's it uses a, uh, an adhesive to to set down onto your onto your floor. There is over $1000 in glue on the upstairs. Any time that like you want to expand the scale of, of a building like this. Even when you're talking about something that is inexpensive per square foot, when you start multiplying it by like thousands of square feet, there's no price tag that sounds affordable. As much as I would like to have had double this space, it was not a possibility at the time. I would have liked to have a, a place big enough that we could like actually run a forklift. There's a lot of stuff now that's starting to show up on full-size semi-trucks that can't make it down my driveway. I have to be able to unload at the street and then pull something all the way back to this building. Uh, yeah, we don't have a place to even park a forklift. Stuff like that, right? More space, always welcome. All right, guys, that pretty much does it for the Hindsight is 2020 episode. Uh, like I said, for the most part, these are not catastrophic. Even though I was able to find a whole bunch of things that I would have liked to have done differently as far as like building this building, I have to say that I am stunned that we got as much right as we did, where like the sort of problems that we're having are on this scale that we're talking about, like basically minor annoyances rather than like catastrophic problems. I definitely don't want to come across as anything other than completely overjoyed by the progress of this building and, and how well it's come together. I'm actually super appreciative and I know that in the future it's going to get a lot better. Thanks again for watching and stay tuned for more updates in the future. Happy reefing guys.